So I am really giving more of a position talk today than a data talk. Uh, but before you roll your eyes too much, as I often do until someone says they're going to do a position talk, I think the material is relevant to a lot of the topics and technologies that we're going to discuss, discuss today. Um, and I'd be interested in kind of talking with more people about it. So my position essentially is that, you know, we're experiencing this renaissance in the diversity of information access technologies that are out there, largely due to the proliferation of, you know, all types of embedded sensors and, and, and portable devices specifically. We're going to talk a lot about those. Um, and it, but, but this comes with some significant kind of problems that are accompanying this advancement. And, and, and the biggest one, uh, at least in my opinion, is uh, really an insufficient consideration of the end user in the design process. And so James kind of already gave my talk, essentially, because he, he hit on this. Uh, but when you ignore the end user, you can really end up with some truly spectacularly bad products. Uh, and so I realize that a lot of people here appreciate the importance of human-centered computing or human-centered design, whatever you want to call it. But that certainly isn't always the case. And I, I, I know this because I have moved from a psychology department to a uh, a computer science department, essentially, where the human is really not always respected in, in design. Uh, not, not always true, but... Uh, so my goal here is really to discuss some common design problems that, 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 that I see out there, to give some solutions that I know have worked in my research and development uh, in the lab, and I think that these are fairly transferable, hopefully. Next. So the new model of assistive technology development, um, you know, Essentially, people are trying to leverage commercial technologies when possible. The most common platform are the smartphones, tablets, what have you. You know, and the beauty of these technologies is that, is that you get this single inexpensive device. It supports multi-purpose use. It incorporates lots of input-output channels. We'll talk about that later, you know, right in the native interface. And so now we have accessible applications that replace, you know, a lot of the, of the old kind of standalone expensive devices. Um, and a major reason why these smart devices can support so many tasks is because they include uh, you know, all types of embedded sensors. We have light sensors and cameras and accelerometers and gyros and GPS and Wi-Fi and what have you. We're going to people here talking about a lot of those. You know, and we've kind of reached the point where sensing technology is cheap, it's small, it's ubiquitous. <laughs> We're getting better sensor fusion algorithms, and so we can do a lot of cool tasks. Um, and this is this is great news. This is great news for assistive technology development, but back to my thesis, uh, a great product needs more than a lot of cool sensors. It, it needs, uh, it must be designed from the onset to consider the user. Okay, next. And so the first challenge that I'm going to talk about is what I, what I call the engineering trap. Uh, and essentially, the engineering trap is when a product or software development occurs uh, simply because it's possible or perhaps because a designer uh, thinks it might be useful, they have a cool idea, they say, okay, we can go out there and try that. Uh, the problem is that naive intuition or use of, a, 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 of you know, uninformed algorithms, and even if elegant, and, and many are, uh, but this generally is not the best approach to guarantee that your design is going to be useful or going to be accepted by your end user. And so the fallout is that we get uh, of this engineering trap is that we end up with products that you know, may provide solutions to problems that, that don't really exist, um, which certainly happens. Or they may address a real issue, but it's not really in a way that users find meaningful or acceptable. And so, you know, essentially, that defeats the purpose. Um, and, you know, there's, again, as, as James mentioned, there's, there's a long history of, of various types of assistive technologies getting stuck in this engineering trap. Uh, I won't point at any here. Uh, specifically, but a lot of times this is because we're using sensors that are providing either irrelevant information or they're providing really complicated information and it seems cool on paper but it's hard to use, or that we're creating devices that try to quote unquote think for us, which a lot of times people uh, don't want. Next. So there are a lot of different ways to avoid the, the engineering trap, and, and, and most of them involve some form of human-centered design, <coughs> essentially knowing your user understanding their, their, their needs and keeping them in the design loop as you, as you work on, you know, develop a product or go through a research uh, paradigm. The first is take the time to do literature search when you're starting a new project. So researchers here say, of course, you know, we, of course you do that. But it's, it's amazing how often it's ignored 
if you're coming from a non-research field or you're doing development of a product in, in industry. Um, you know, because it's, 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 it's boring to go back and look at research. But the bottom line is that this, you know, little bit of digging can provide a huge amount of information about what problems exist and best solutions. Second, uh, talk to potential end users. A great way to avoid the, the engineering trap is to, to get input from people that are going to use your product. And a great way to do this is a, a focus group. This is something that's fast, cheap, simple, and it tells you a ton about what, what people want, what people don't want. Um, you know, and this obviously has a direct correlation on the feature set that you're thinking about including, um, and what have you, when, when, when you're developing your uh, device or a product. Another useful tool um, when starting a project or even a grant, this is something that I uh, think is, is really important, is to talk to uh, expert users. You know, I think phenomenology is something that's not considered enough. I know for me, my first-hand experience, my, my phenomena, phenomenology uh, as a blind guy has, has, has led a lot of the questions that I ask in my research, and, and that's, I think, um, been very important. I don't think it's a coincidence that many of the, the, the leaders in low vision research and, and product development, and, and some are here in this room, uh, are themselves blind. So that's a good resource. Um, Another way, three here, perform uh, user testing throughout the design process. Again, everyone says, oh yeah, it's a good plan, but, but oftentimes it doesn't get done or it gets done at the end. Uh, but but uh, I think part of the problem here is that people think of user testing and they think of these big behavioral experiments and, and they get scared off. But the reality is a simple usability study with you know, even five subjects can identify the vast majority of interface problems. And you do this in the beginning, it's, it, it, you know, and you, and you can just use prototypes or hacks or Wizard of Oz, anything that gets the participant in front of what you're, what you're looking at. These results, uh, you know, they provide great feedback, they identify all types of problems that are going to be a heck of a lot harder and a lot more expensive to fix down the road. Um, another great, a great technique, um, and this is especially for low vision technology, um, have the designer directly experience the problem that they're interested in addressing without vision. So this is assuming that it's a sighted person. You know, the reality is, is, is that it's very hard, it's just hard for a sighted person to know what it's like to be blind, <coughs> as it is for, for a blind person to understand a lot of visual concepts. I mean, I, I, I still am utterly befuddled by how three-dimensional representations are shown on two-dimensional planes. I understand it cognitively, but when I think about how it works, I just don't get it. Uh, but, but I found that it's really, you know, especially with my students, giving them first-hand experience with whatever we're working on and really pushing them to try it out is far more useful than just saying, think about a solution or think about, you know, what, what the challenges are. All right, uh, another aspect um, of the engineering trap is this kind of belief that a system must work completely without human intervention. It must just work, and I think this is completely wrong. So it turns out that humans themselves, we have this nervous system that's a great real-time sensor network. And we even have a kind of a powerful computer that's attached. Uh, you know, it, 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 it beats most, or any AI system that's out there right now. So essentially, my, my, my point is that there's, there's nothing wrong with having the user play a role in, in, in the operation of a system. And kind of using the, 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 the user as a sensor, I think, is, uh, can be very beneficial and, and isn't done nearly enough. All right, next. Another major challenge for assistive technology development is that it often occurs without solid <coughs> theoretical knowledge of relevant perceptual and, and, and cognitive characteristics of the human. Again, this is a, a big problem when, when you're dealing, especially with uh, conversion of information, so visual information to, to, to non-visual output, any type of translation, you have to understand the perceptual aspects involved. So, you know, something as simple as you look at a visual map, you say, okay, I'm going to convert that to a tactile map. Well, how do you do that when essentially vision has five times, 500 times greater bandwidth than, than, than touch? Uh, you have to really understand a lot of the downsampling characteristics. This is a big topic. Uh, I don't really want to go into it much except to say that it's important to think about. I go through it extensively in the, uh, there's a chapter cited here from the, uh, Roberto's uh, book that just came out, actually, that really goes into it quite a bit. Uh, a related phenomena 
to information processing is that usually assistive technology is, is, is it's generally more intuitive, it generally requires less cognitive effort when it's based on perceptual interfaces versus uh, cognitively mediated interfaces. So what I mean here is, um, uh, Mike, Mike May, where are you? So, so Mike, he's talking, I hear him in space. I hear him, uh, uh, you know, a specific, specific direction, a specific distance. If he keeps talking and I turn, I hear this flow of information. That's perceptual. It's much easier to, to deal with that than if someone says Mike said, uh, you know, 11 o'clock and 20 feet. You have to process what that means. So in general, focusing on perceptual interfaces is, is easier. Not always possible, but next. My last, my last kind of cautionary note or something that I've thought about in my work is that, you know, it's, it's compelling to try to want to come up with this one perfect design, but it's just not possible. And so, but, but there are some things that you can do to kind of increase your, your user base and your functionality. The first is, it seems that a, a lot of technology over constrains the target demographic that, that, that they're developing for. And, and, and to me, it seems like you can do a lot, you'd be a lot better off being more inclusive. So for example, we, we can argue the number a little bit, but around 5% of, of legally blind people are, are totally blind. It's a very, very small percent. And the, but the majority of, of research, the majority of, of applications, you know, technologies, um, focuses on, on this small group. And so, you know, I feel that the, the legally blind people share a lot of the same challenges for accessing information in the environment as, as totals do. Um, and so, you know, how do we tap that? Don't, try to figure out, think of ways that you could tap this bigger population. If you have a screen on your device already, think about magnification or adding a screen. So things like that can, can make a device that potentially is going to work for a small group of people work for a lot more. And I think that's something that needs to be done more. Um, when possible, use multimodal input and output. So again, uh, a lot of the devices, especially the platforms that we're talking about, smart devices already incorporate all this stuff. Um, so if you want to ha think about having multiple paths to executing the same end, you have a touch screen, well then you can already have touch screen or gestures or there's a mic, you can have voice input, um, you just need to implement it. The same for output, multiple channels helps different learning styles. So if you can use vision, sound, vibration, these are things that um, a lot of smart devices already do and I think it's a, it's a smart way to uh, develop inclusively. All right, next. Two minutes. All right, try to be fast. Very briefly talk about some research that I'm doing. I'm most excited about the use of, of, of spatialized audio and vibrotactile uh, interfaces because they're, they're both perceptual. Uh, they use embedded sensors, smart devices. They provide access to that dynamic information in the environment. And I'm particularly excited about um, research that we're doing with what I'm calling a vibro audio interface. And so essentially this is providing access to visual information uh, via vibration and via audio output as a person moves their finger around a touch screen. So you move your finger around when you touch the element, you get vibration and auditory information. Next, uh, this will be the last. I, I can't do a talk with no data, so here's a little data. Um, using this interface, we've done this with a, a bunch of different types of tasks. This is just looking at uh, five measures of, of graph interpretation and, and recreation, comparing blindfolded sighted and blind subjects. Um, both using the Vibro audio interface on a tablet versus kind of traditional embossed hard copy. And, and the key result here is that, that, that there's a striking similarity be, for, be, for performance between display modes and, and subject groups across all of these measures. And so you know, the take home is, well, we're, we're, uh, we're using this Vibro, Vibro audio interface. It's very simple to use. People have had about 30 minutes to learn it. They've never learned it before, and they're, it's off a commercial device, and they're doing about as well as they're doing using a traditional hard copy device. And so we're now <laughs> extending this work to doing map learning, to doing figures, and looking at panning and zooming, and lots of different things that could be used for indoor and outdoor navigation. Uh, but I think there's a huge potential for this uh, type of technology because it's so inexpensive and it seems so robust in the classroom, in the workplace, and it's something I'm, I'm really excited about and uh, hope to continue talking with people about. And next slide, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, talk to everyone later. Sorry about that.
no talk would be complete with that. So, uh, any questions? Roberto will try to find you and hand you a mic. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on your uh, point about having students and people experience who are sighted experience um, things as a blinded person. Could you just give some examples of how you do it? Or I mean, I was just wondering. Yeah. So per first off, I mean, just some something as simple as if we're interested in trying to figure out how to walk around in a building. Oh. Um, talking about walking around in a, in a building, I do a lot of work with indoor navigation without without vision. Um, you know, I'll I'll often blindfold a, a, a student or whoever I'm I'm with. I don't I don't make them bump off the walls. So we'll guide them, but just walk around. And say, what are you perceiving? What are the challenges that you're having? Getting them to think about it from a first hand perspective versus just sitting in the lab saying, oh, I think it would be like X. Uh, dropping someone into that experience, it, it, it can be very simple. Uh, tends to come back and just make more informed, kind of creative responses. Any more questions? No. Hold on, I'll be right there. Thank you. And there is an extent to where you can also attempt to embed them continuously during development. An example would be when we had a Braille device the sighted programmers working on it, we actually put a little flap cover over the, the visual display so that whenever they wanted to see what was on the display that was mapping the braille display, they had to reach over and tie up a hand to lift the thing up to be able to see it. Just as we would have to, to reach over and tie up our hand uh, to read the braille. So there's very often doing things like that to uh, quote handicap them throughout the development uh, is useful. Yeah, I, 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 I completely, completely, because uh, you know, those are things that you don't necessarily think about until, until you're doing them. You know, and then when, when they're actually doing it, they're saying, oh, yeah, I guess I, I don't want to have to, uh, you know, take another hand because of whatever I'm drinking coffee or whatever. But you would never think about it unless you actually force that situation to happen. So, yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a good example. And we have a question from Jim. I think it's going to be the last one. Here's a quick uh, ask for your thoughts here, but I get to review too many papers that end up having three or four subjects that are all just blindfolded, decided people. And w what are your thoughts on the validity of doing that? And but I'm wasting my time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get into trouble here. I, I have I, I've thought about this. I'm actually beginning a paper on it, but but I know it will get rejected. I, I, I think I think blindfolded sighted participants are fine for certain types of tasks. I think it's a conservative measure. So a, a blind person is going to have. I mean, we, there's a lot of work that talks about this. There aren't difference in thresholds. We can we can talk about there's certain things where experience makes a big difference. But if we're doing a search task or we're doing certain types of spatial tasks, both groups have those abilities, a blind person might be more efficient. So if you're using a blindfolded sighted person as kind of a part of a test bed of, of evaluation, I think if anything, that's a conservative. If they can do it, then a blind person is likely going to be, do, be able to do it even better. I don't think it's, everything should be based on that. But I absolutely disagree with the majority of my colleagues that say that there's no value in using blindfolded sighted people. I'd love to get in a long debate about this at some point because I think there's good pros and cons, but I, I think this is an easy thing that reviewers say, oh, you use blindfolded sighted people, that's stupid. I just don't agree. It looks like room for debate. Okay, well, thank you very much, Nick, again. And